What is up you guys? Welcome back to my 2022 NBA playoff prediction series. It is time for round two. But first, these past two weeks of playoff basketball were a ton of fun to watch. I did my best to not miss a single minute of action. Minus, of course, when two games are running at the same time during the weekdays. So like a lot of you guys watching, I'm sure, I got to see pretty much it all unfold. Looking back at my previous video, we see that my first round thoughts were decently accurate. A lot of the pros and cons of each team that I thought would happen did happen. Some teams let me down, some teams put up a much bigger fight than I anticipated. And of course, injuries mess up everything every year, so no point in crying about that. If you are curious, I was able to predict six of the eight series winners. The only two that I got wrong were long shots that I felt like just going for kind of randomly. I thought the Raptors could pull off a miracle against the Sixers, and I don't know why I thought the Hawks would beat the Heat. They had momentum, but it was only two games worth of momentum, so that was kind of silly on my part. Also, I want to add that uh, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving... They really underperformed, which is why they got swept by Boston. The franchise is falling apart. Uh, the Bulls looked pathetic after two halfway decent games. The Pelicans proved to be a team that will be a problem next year. As they, uh, if they would have played a more uh, lesser team than the Phoenix Suns, like say the Pelicans that started off the season a little better, I think they could be in the second round right now. And lastly, I think Nikola Jokic really looked like the MVP despite his team losing in five. But before we get started actually with those uh, second round predictions, please like the video. It really does help me out much more than I think you guys realize. Now, let us get going. Starting with the East, we have the number one seed, Miami Heat taking on the number four seed, Philadelphia 76ers. In round one, the Heat dominated the Hawks in a gentleman's sweep doing exactly what they have done all year long. And Philly dominated games 1, 2, and 3 before going ice cold and looking lost for a couple games and rekindling the fire for game 6. But now both are heading into the second round without key contributors. For Miami, Kyle Lowry has a strained hamstring and Jimmy Butler has something going on with his knee. This leaves both players out for an unknown amount of time. But there is optimism Butler will at least be back sooner rather than later. Philly inarguably has a much bigger injury problem going on. Superstar, do-it-all big man Joel Embiid fractured a bone in his face and suffered a concussion in the final minutes of their last game with the Raptors, which is absolutely devastating to say the least for the Sixers. This morning, a quote came out from Doc Rivers saying that he does not regret having Embiid in the game at that moment, and that is just ridiculous. Every single time, if he could go back, he would have pulled him out of the game sooner. But hey, Doc Rivers says some foolish things. Unlike the Heat, the Sixers are much more top-heavy, so I think this injury to Embiid is going to be pretty catastrophic for their success. The Heat as a whole are a good three-point shooting team who plays smothering defense around the perimeter, forcing bad shots and a lot of turnovers. Atlanta, a team usually known for their high-octane offense, was stifled greatly by them. James Harden is a significant step slower this year than ever before, so I am worried about how he will do, especially without Embiid to defer to. He has been opting to pass more lately, and though Tobias Harris and Tyrese Maxey have stepped up big time with their scoring, I am not sure how those two will fare against a better defensive team in the Heat. Philly also struggles with cleaning up missed shots, and without Embiid, I expect Adebayo and Butler to be menaces on the offensive glass. But Miami isn't perfect either. As a result of their aggressive defense, Miami tends to foul too much. Harden and eventually Embiid are the kings of drawing fouls, and the trio of Harden, Maxi, and Harris are great shooters from all over. They're all capable of not needing to drive inside, instead shooting threes at a lights out rate. Once Embiid returns, he will be a force to be reckoned with inside, because even though Adebayo is a good defensive center, there's really no one in the league who can stop Embiid. I'm really conflicted with the prediction for this series because of the major question mark that is Joel Embiid's injury, but in the end, I think he's going to miss at least a couple games, and that's going to be too much. I have the Heat winning this series in six. 
Next up, the number two Boston Celtics versus the number three Milwaukee Bucks. I already alluded to this, but the Celtics absolutely embarrassed the Brooklyn Nets in round one. The whole team stepped up to the occasion and overthrew Vegas and mainstream media's number one choice to win the whole shebang. Now the Nets are spiraling and on the verge of throwing away another four to five years by committing to Kyrie Irving long term, which I find absolutely hilarious. Good for them. Uh, the Bucks, meanwhile, did a very similar thing to the Chicago Bulls, especially in the final three games of the series, as those ones were never interesting. The Celtics have the best team defensive rating in the entire NBA, but on the flip side, the Bucks have the third highest offensive rating. A major part of Boston's success on the defensive end is thanks to their ability to clog the paint and force opposing teams to settle for mid to long range attempts. The Celtics actually forced the most long twos in the entire NBA, and their opposition struggles mightily with these as well as their three point shot attempts. For the Bucks, though, other than their star player Giannis Antetokounmpo, the team likes to shoot threes. About 43% of their shots are already threes, and that's including Giannis dragging that number down. Of course, they do not have Chris Middleton. He is the injury that they are dealing with right now, and it is a hamstring injury, so kind of like Kyle Lowry, he could be out for a few games. But role guys Grayson Allen, Wesley Matthews, and Javon Carter all shot 40% or better in round one from long range. And that's not even including guys like Drew Holiday, Pat Connaughton, Bobby Portis, and Brooke Lopez, who normally can shoot that well as well. That's seven quality shooters even without Middleton. And Giannis's efforts to get to the rim, I have seen be described as an unstoppable force attacking an immovable object. The Celtics interior of Al Horford, Daniel Tice, and Robert Williams is arguably the best inside defensive presence still in the playoffs. Giannis, though, draws a ton of fouls. This could be a problem for Boston as they tend to surrender more fouls than most. And even if they don't foul, Giannis is very good at getting into the restricted area. From there, he is very likely to score because despite Boston's good defense inside and out on the floor, they actually give up a pretty high field goal percentage over 70% at the rim. The Bucks do not have a weakness. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but it's true. They're not in the top 10 worst of really anything I looked at. But Boston does have more guys capable of creating looks for themselves than Milwaukee does. Obviously, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown will do most of the playmaking, but Marcus Smart, Peyton Pritchard, and Derek White are all still very solid playmakers regardless of who is in front of them. Really, this is a crazy tight series. I don't like that Middleton is hurt, but even so, I'm going to predict the Milwaukee Bucks take this in seven. Moving to the west, we have the number one Phoenix Suns versus the number four Dallas Mavericks. The Suns looked dominant in their first six quarters of their series with the Pelicans, but a hamstring injury to Devin Booker left them pretty devastated. I know people don't like to talk about these guys, but the reason the Suns had such struggles in their games without Booker is because of the increased roles head coach Monty Williams gave to Cameron Payne and Jay Crowder. Those two guys shot the Suns to death twice in their first round matchup. Payne scored five points a game on a 31-16 shooting split, and Crowder scored seven a night on a 33-11 split. That was 15 shots a night to two duds who for some reason never seem to realize when they're having an off night, and honestly, it seems like they force more shots when they're playing poorly than when they're playing well. Dallas, meanwhile, patiently waited for the return of Luka Doncic, then proceeded to crush the hopes and dreams of the Utah Jazz yet again. Jalen Brunson and Luka have looked like superstars through round one. But for this series, everything gets set back to zero, of course. Regardless of who is on the floor, the Suns have one of the best defensive teams in the entire league. They are exceptionally gifted at forcing bad shots and turnovers. Meanwhile, offensively being well-rounded inside and out. Aiton averaged 20 points on a 70% field goal percentage in round one, and that was against Jonas Valanciunas, a pretty big defensive guy. The Mavericks, however, lack anything close to an elite big man. Their best bet is Dwight Powell, but the Suns also have this tendency to go for a double center lineup by sticking either JaVale McGee or Bismack Biombo on the floor. 
JaVale, if you're curious, put up 8 a night in the first round on 80% field goal percentage. The Mavs have nothing to do against that inside. But the three-point shooting could save them. The Mavs shot more threes per game in round one than anyone else. If Luka, Jalen, and one of their more specialized three-point shooters like Spencer Dinwiddie or Davis Pertans can get hot, then they are capable of putting up a lot of points in a hurry. Still though, I am worried about the Mavs' weak interior presence. They don't rebound well, which will be a problem against the Suns who have a lot of good rebounders. They are not particularly good at getting to the foul line, whereas the Suns are really good at avoiding fouls. Plus, I have not even mentioned Chris Paul, a master on the floor who regardless of the situation can orchestrate an offense better than just about anyone in the league. His ball handling, passing, and mid-range shooting ability are unstoppable. And regardless of who Dallas puts on him, there's nothing that can be done. He will always find the best shot for his team. I commend Dallas for getting to the second round with a roster that has such a glaring weakness inside and isn't very deep around the perimeter, but in the end, they aren't getting out of round two. Give me the Suns in five. And lastly, we have the number two Memphis Grizzlies versus the number three Golden State Warriors. In case you have not noticed, not a single underdog won a first round series, which is kind of disappointing. The Grizzlies played a chaotic series with the Timberwolves that was full of amazing highlights. The Warriors, meanwhile, made pretty quick work of the Nuggets by overpowering them with their unstoppable offensive barrage, especially from three. In round two, despite being the higher seed, the Grizzlies are without a doubt the underdog. Both the Grizzlies and Warriors are known for their defensive strength. The Grizzlies are great at forcing turnovers and grabbing rebounds, especially offensive boards, which gives them the most second chance opportunities in the league. Of course, Steven Adams is a major reason for this, and he was rendered unplayable in their first round matchup due to the fact that Minnesota's Carl Anthony Towns was too mobile around the perimeter for Adams to deal with. The Warriors do play Kevon Looney a little bit, but for the most part, about 32 minutes a night, he's off the floor. So Adams' strengths should be negated. Memphis is also a good rim protecting team, but they do tend to foul too much. Golden State doesn't get to the rim very much though. Only about 8% of their looks were at the rim in round one, and it's not really because of Jokic, he's not a rim protector. So the pros and cons here are completely negated. Memphis though has guys like Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. who love to drive to the hoop, and as a result often draw many fouls. The Warriors are good at blocking drives to the lane and forcing turnovers, so this may hinder the Memphis attack, but Golden State does like fouling too much. Memphis will shoot a ton of free throws in this series, which is a huge plus for them because that is consistent points. But where the greatest difference maker lies in this matchup is the long range shooting. The Warriors are killer from outside and they shoot a ton of threes. Stephen Curry, Klay Thompson, Jordan Poole, Andrew Wiggins, and Gary Payton the second all shot over 40% from deep in round one. And on the other hand, Memphis only had Desmond Bain and Tyus Jones accomplish this. The Warriors can erupt for a ton of points in a hurry, which could be devastating in any game. But this is something that comes and goes. It can be hindered, and Memphis can capitalize on the more efficient scoring options by attacking the rim and getting free throws. This is going to be an exciting matchup, but in the end, I am not convinced Memphis has what it takes to manage the hot streaks the Warriors will hit them with. Give me the Gold State Warriors in six. So there you have it, my round two predictions for this 2022 NBA playoffs. If everything goes exactly as I predict it to be, we will have a conference finals of the Miami Heat versus Milwaukee Bucks and the Phoenix Suns and the Golden State Warriors, which will be pretty exciting. Please let me know what you think of my analysis down below. Let me know who you have. And let me know who you have winning each matchup. Please comment, like the video, and subscribe. I will see you all next time.